Hello, and welcome to the um, third session of the virtual symposium for the Center for Corporate Reputation. My name is Chris McKenna, and we're uh, just starting this at the moment. We're going to be, I hope everybody is coming in soon. Sorry, um, my name is Chris McKenna, and I'm going to be uh, the chair along with Frank Partnoy on what is the third session of the annual symposium um, by the Center for Corporate Reputation in Oxford. And it's my great delight to do this. Um, I've been associated with the center since its start in 2008 and watched the center evolve over many years. It's a tremendous place. It's an interdisciplinary center within the University of Oxford that is directed by Rupert Younger. And it's within the Said Business School, but extends across the university and across the world. It studies the way that organizations form, sustain, and lose their reputations. And it was, um, and it, it, it funds a great number of uh, researchers and actively is recruiting even more at the moment. It has within it some 42 international research fellows, as well as a series of visiting fellows, more than 64, within uh, industry, politics, government, and the rest of the world. This symposium is the, is the great event every year, and it brings together scholars, practitioners, and it goes on for three days, and it's just a tremendous way to organize your calendar. So hope you'll all come back again and again. Unfortunately, COVID has meant that we couldn't do it in person in Oxford this year or actually the year before. But this year, obviously, we have three sessions virtual, and we hope that you'll enjoy this and will actively participate. Um, we're bringing the, together the great community, and I hope that you feel part of it because we certainly enjoy it. Let me introduce uh, the three people who will be speaking initially. We hope to have a really interesting conversation today. And those three, um, we're going to be talking about fraud, malpractice, and its connection to reputation. Our first, uh, first speaker is David Kirsch, who's associate professor at the University of Maryland, where he looks at the intersection of technology and uh, entrepreneurship and history, which is uh, one sense of our interdisciplinarity. Um, he was trained at Stanford, and his first book was on the history of electric vehicles, which I think at the time before the rise of Tesla and other electric vehicles, people didn't realize how important they were in the early history and didn't realize how important they would become. And his most recent book is on bubbles and crashes associated with new technology. So it may be no surprise that he's going to talk to us a bit about reputation um, in connection with Elon Musk and Tesla. Our second uh, speaker is Brooke Harrington, who's professor of sociology at Dartmouth. And she works, uh, her first work was on offshore wealth advisors um, that came out of her doctorate at Harvard and was published as Wealth Without Borders. She also has experience in the profession, something very interesting to me, and wealth stratification. Brooke's going to talk about the tensions between the sort of advice that wealth advisors give and the public uh, perceptions around practice or, or other sorts of issues that arise. Finally, to cap it all off, Frank Partnoy, who teaches law at Berkeley, um, is a perfect person to talk to the two sides of this because he's been both a lawyer um, and a practitioner on Wall Street and an academic uh, uh, researcher on, on corporate governance for many years. He's written both uh, public books on how markets work and a terrific book on Ivar Kruger, who I'm, I'm very fond, which I'm very fond of and find fascinating, and, uh, and really good, great um, academic articles on the mechanics of markets. He'll talk about his current research on reputation. He's a great expert on this, particularly since we all enjoy his annual fraud fest that he puts on. Anyway, those are the three. And if I could ask, and, and we're, we're going to try to do this quickly so we can get your perspectives as well. We want you to ask questions. We want you to contribute. And so we're going to try to go through this quickly and then turn it over to you. So David, if you're willing to start, uh, that would be terrific. I, I've been um, talking to David about Elon Musk for a while, and he has a lot of interesting things to say. Over to you. OK. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. And I will um, uh, try and note the time and by all means cut me off. 
uh, if I'm uh, prattling on. And I would just say, by way of correction, I believe Professor Harrington's first book was actually about pop finance and investment clubs, um, which actually is uh, very uh, relevant to the uh, topic uh, I'll be discussing with you today, which is sort of, you know, kind of the mother of all online investment clubs, um, also known as Tesla. So, uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's great work. And uh, uh, actually, and I, I think Chris, you and I have spoken about this work as well, so I know you know it. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the paper today, uh, Reputation and Misrepresentation and the Rise of Tesla's work with uh, a colleague, um, uh, Mohsen Chowdhury, who's I think in, in the audience and uh, um, very much a full participant in this. Um, you can uh, ask him all the hard questions. I will say uh, I'm delighted to be participating in the reputation conference uh, I, for my aborted sabbatical in, in, in 2020. Uh, I sat across, I sat in Chris McKenna's office across from the a reputation center for 17 whole days before COVID sent me home. So I, I definitely feel like a part of this extended community and it's, it's great to be here. So thank you. Um, I'm going to tell a story about Tesla and Elon Musk. And I'm just going to start by sort of framing it for us. There are these two competing narratives about, about Tesla and Elon Musk. There's this one version of it, the sort of the inspiration for Tony Stark, the he was pro, you know, Elon Musk was profiled by Melissa Schilling in, in her book Quirky and compared to Einstein. He's sort of venerated for transcending some of the, you know, what we would think of as the uh, sort of types of different celebrity CEOs. He's both uh, creator, transformer, rebel, and savior, and not just of the firm, but of humanity. He's, to my to my best of my knowledge, the only sitting CEO to host Saturday Night Live here in the US. And his, his fans will say he's occasionally overly optimistic because of his entrepreneurial enthusiasm and impatience. So in short, he's kind of the quintessential celebrity CEO. I compare him here to, to Steve Jobs. Um, the other story, the other version of, of Elon Musk is a little less positive. He's seen as a poor manager who can't retain staff, a kind of egomaniac who harasses his workers and sues his critics. He perennially exaggerates and knowingly makes statements that are misleading or worse and skates over uh, guide rails that would land other less prominent, less seemingly indispensable CEOs out of a job. In short, he's a well-known type of fraud uh, whose company by implication is destined to fail. And you know, it's, I, I chose Elizabeth Holmes here. It's you know, not coincidence that uh, she is, her trial is opening this week um, on, on charges of fraud. So which is it? Um, rather than trying to answer that question, I'm just going to set out to explore these two, two narratives. And uh, the narratives was, uh, uh, Chris, you were kind enough to mention my book on bubbles and crashes. So narratives were really at the heart of that story, uh, that, that book about uh, technological innovations. And what I wanted to do for the next few minutes is just talk about who are the communities who are producing and consuming these narratives about uh, Tesla and Elon Musk? What can we observe about their identities? Where do they come from? How do they see each other? How are they mobilized? And finally, do these kind of social symbolic actions, if I'm thinking of uh, Tom Lawrence's uh, recent book, how do these social symbolic actions matter? And that's a, a sort of the outline. Um, and I'll, I'll give some caveats up front. We're using almost exclusively communications on Twitter. We map those to events in the real world, but this was is Musk's preferred communication channel. So we're really trying to study mobilization uh, and reputation on Twitter. Uh, many of the participants have chosen to remain anonymous uh, or tried to. And in part, this was because doxing was one of Musk's means of silencing critics. He'd sort of um, expose people and, and uh, in, in a way of, um, you know, it, which was viewed as, uh, again, one of those kind of crossing the red lines that would have landed other people out of a job. 
We also know that many of the participants are non-human actors. So they're bots, lots of bots in, in our data. And some created even on the same day in response to negative PR. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, I mean, we do know why, we don't exactly know how or who. Uh, we focus more on the critics of Tesla because they're theoretically interesting and also less visible. The, the sort of fanboys and social media amplification side of this is pretty well documented. And I want to be very clear to acknowledge up front that as of September 2021, Tesla's doing great, right? They've got in the last couple of years, $500 billion of additional market cap, $20 billion of fresh capital in the corporate treasury, not to mention Musk's additional $100 billion in additional personal wealth, which is itself the subject of an ongoing class action lawsuit. So Tesla's doing great. We're interested in sort of what happened, who was talking about it, what, what was the debate going on, and, and who was mobilizing pro and con uh, when they weren't doing so great, and when it was uncertain what, what was going to happen. So just quickly, who are the audiences? Uh, I have a tweet over here from actually just from last week when uh, Tesla announced their Optimus bot, their sort of humanoid robot which is total vapor. Um, and the, the tweet sort of sums up the, the issue that we're trying to get at, right? That the Tesla community is losing its mind over Optimus Bot. So if you go on the Tesla sites, everyone's going crazy. The stock market at that point wasn't so impressed. Mainstream media is laughing. Academics are mocking. Analysts are puzzled. Tesla Q are hating. Spoiler alert, opportunity Tesla, invest. Right, so this is kind of the, where we see these different audiences uh, um, kind of put forward to us. So, you know, Elon Musk has 50 million Twitter followers more than any other business person on the world, in the world. And he also amplifies those, uh, that impact through a network of high influence followers. And there are these analysts who are sort of playing catch up with Musk. Uh, in a lot of other instances, we see the analysts kind of setting this, the, um, agenda for the narrative. Here, the analysts are responding to Musk, and then they're the media who have to cover Musk and the analysts. And then they're the investors, so they're retail investors, the sort of Tesla bros on, on, on Robinhood, they're the institutional investors, they're the cheerleaders, and the short sellers. So, and, and then they're the millions of sort of Tesla bros, these kind of self-identified self-identified pro-tech, anti-oil uh, fanboys. And then there's a small community of vigilant critics who are mobilized by perceived fraud. And that's where, where we're really going to try and uh, get to. So what identities do we see on Twitter? We scraped all the tweets that use the hashtag Tesla or the cash tag Tesla and the hashtag Tesla Q, cash tag Tesla Q. So just for those who don't know, um, it is common parlance when a company is insolvent it's, and files for bankruptcy, the, the letter Q is appended to its stock symbol. So if Procter & Gamble were insolvent, it would trade, the insolvent security would trade PGQ. So this group added Q to indicate their belief that uh, Tesla was in fact insolvent, that it was, it was a fraud. And so what you see across the bottom there, you don't have to look at, it's, it's a, over a several year period, the red lines are the daily kind of impact of, of the Tesla tweets, the green ones underneath are the Tesla Q tweets, and then there's a group that uses both Tesla and Tesla Q tweets. And so you just sort of see this over time, a uh, kind of a uh, conversation happening um, a, a, among these different communities. And if you just kind of take the, 50,000 foot level, you see the Tesla community is much bigger, about eight times the Tesla Q community. There's very minimal overlap of top users between Tesla and Tesla Q. So some people are using both hashtags, but that it's not the majority. And the, the smaller Tesla Q crowd is also is more concentrated. There's, it's kind of a tighter identity, what we would, what we would expect from a kind of counter movement. Um, you know, it's, it's a tight-knit group. Um, we don't know where they come from, but they don't move camps. 
So we don't see people who are initially in hashtag Tesla and then later in ha hashtag Tesla Q. It see, appears that these are different types of people who are being activated at different points in time. We see that at least eight of the 40 most active accounts in Tesla are bots. And they were all launched within one hour of each other on November 7th, 2013, following a, the announcement of a fire in a Tesla and the stock dropping 30%. So there, somebody knew that this was a way to manage uh, online reputation in effect. And we find no high activity bots in Tesla Q. Tesla Q appeared to be humans. Uh, Tesla Q is reactive. They appear in early 2018, ramping up in June following the doxing of a well-known Tesla critic. And prior to 2018, uh, it's not, we, as a, you know, sort of reiterating what I've said up above, Tesla Q was not sort of incubating within Tesla. There's not a lot of um, kind of critics in Tesla who then jumped to Tesla Q. There was sort of disarray and fragmentation in Tesla Q that suggests they don't have, you know, in spite of their kind of, it's a tight group, they don't actually have a single issue that they are, that they're focused on. And just, I won't go through all the details on this, but you can, I'm happy to share the slides. There's a lot of different issues that mobilize the Tesla Q community. So there's, you know, kind of distrust of, of grand narratives. There's a kind of righteousness. They feel like the investment community is doing a bad job. Some of them have knowledge of particular subfields that Elon Musk kind of transgresses. So he, he'll, he'll say something about solar power and then some solar power person will come on and be like, that's crazy. That'll never work. Tesla Q. Um, they're, they're enraged at Elon Musk for his lies. So they don't view his misstatements as kind of innocent, over-optimistic, um, overconfident statements by a, um, a magical entrepreneur, they view them as lies. Um, and they are upset at the seemingly corrupt system that enables his behavior to go unpunished. So th there's a whole set of, of um, arguments. And I kind of pulled this one tweet that sort of summarizes the Tesla Q bear thesis, you know, poor quality plus poor service, brand destruction, brand destruction plus strong competition plus lost tax incentives equals demand collapse, demand collapse, but plus piss poor management equals financial ruin, Tesla Q. You know, this is kind of, it, it, this should be self-evident if you just, you know, just look. So this is kind of, but these are the ideas that are circulating inside this, this community. Um, and, you know, here's some other examples. I'm a little mindful of time, so I'm going to kind of zip along. But you can see, you know, uh, they're, they're kind of trying to be reasonable about this. Like, honest question, why does Elon care about the stock price so much? Well, because it made him $100 billion. <laughs> That's why he cares about it. Um, there is this community feel. So again, some, uh, you can see this at Vert's. Uh, tweets, holy cow, what a stooge. I didn't know what Tesla Q was until today, or rather didn't know it had a name, but I'm on board. And then this Elon promised, who's sort of one of the Tesla Q people, sort of welcome averts, you know, adverts to Tesla Q. Um, hey, show, show them around, make them feel comfortable. So th there is this kind of community uh, identity um, within the Tesla Q crowd. And there are a few other, you know, here's some more from Elon promised. Uh, you know, God save us from men with more vision than morality. Uh, you know, but investors may disagree. <laughs> we'll take vision over morality any day. And then there's this one really important person named Lawrence Fossey, who uh, went by the name of Montana Skeptic. And he was a, a kind of an original sort of critic. He, he wrote this long paper uh, that was published on Seeking Alpha kind of debunking the, the, the Musk uh, story. And uh, he was doxxed and fired uh, from his job. And you know, so uh, you see this tweet here, as longtime fraud investigators and financial analysts, we are appalled at the treatment of Montana skeptic. If there wasn't already a red flag on Tesla before, there certainly is now. So this was really, again, this kind of transgressive behavior by a CEO to personally expose somebody, you know, so Musk called Montana, uh, Lawrence Fossey's boss and said, oh, you, you know, this guy is uh, um, uh, uh, trash talking my company. You're a big supporter of mine. You should fire him. 
And they even went so far, so this Shorty Air Force was a group that would literally fly their planes over Tesla parking lots to report on unsold inventory. I mean, these are there, there was a really a lot of activity here that is not motivated by money. These were the, the people who were flying these little private planes were not, you know, Jim Chano's huge hedge fund uh, short sellers. These, these were people who, who were um, morally outraged um, on behalf of the people who uh, Tesla and uh, in particular Musk had offended. So uh, the analysts, I'm going to skip this. Just so you can see, there is a view of Tesla uh, Q within the Tesla community. So the Tesla, the Tesla people are, are sort of always complaining about the, the negativity of the Tesla Q people. You have your money in oil, says this person on the right. You guys are so ignorant. Um, you know, or here's how Shortsville works. You know, all, they're, they're upvoting all this negative stuff about Tesla when the vast majority of it is very positive. You know, okay, yeah, so a few fires, a few people have been killed by full self-drive, um, but look at all the good things that the company's doing. Uh, so th th there is this kind of interaction, but um, it's, it's not, there's not much of it. Uh, a few others, so yeah, this guy, Mark Spiegel, you know, who was one of the kind of notable Tesla Q, saddest bear of all time, filthy apartment, tiny chihuahua running around, Twitter command center in his bathroom, and a tiny fund of grandma's money of $2 million. Who trusts this guy? Um, so, you know, there's this kind of back and forth between these, these two groups. And this is just shows the activities that mobilize them. And we see some dri different drivers of online um, activity. And I'll just wrap up by saying, does it matter? Right? You can say, oh, this is just Twitter stuff. You're just looking at, at um, epiphenomena. Um, and like, here's where we are as of summer of 2021. So Tesla, market cap is 30%, almost about 30% of the total global auto industry. Their production is 1%. They have put 20 billion on, on the balance sheet and they, they've been, you know, 20 billion changes the texture <laughs> of the landscape of competition. Um, so it, it has mattered. And I just, well, let's see if we can um, just, to kind of pull it together, I'm going to just say, you know, he faked it till he made it. He did it. Um, so he has, you know, this famous and infamous person, in addition to building a car company, has exploited his celebrity to mobilize an immense following that has made him one of the richest people in the world. He did it. These competing persistent narratives within these distinct online communities contributed to a divergence between price and value. And the persistence of that divergence has allowed the company to uh, raise a bunch of money. And just to be clear, this phenomenon has become a pattern in my view. Uh, you know, Tesla, the meme stocks, the SPACs, uh, Tesla now is in the S&P 500. So our retirement accounts are part of this phenomenon. We are all um, in this game. So um, thank you. Uh, questions and reactions are welcome. And um, uh, apologies for running a minute or two over. People, by the way, I wanted to mention that the uh, Q&A is where we can collect questions. Um, and there is a question from Greg Clark about the network of followers. But I think um, that David's, I'm just going to say, I think David's answered that well. And I'd like to keep going if I can for the moment. But please do park some questions in there. And if I can, I'd like to ask Brooke to give her um, thoughts on this question, uh, on the general question, and uh, let, set it over to her. So Brooke, if you could take over, that would be fantastic. To stay within time, I may, I may end up speaking a little more quickly than I normally would, because I want to show you some, some data from, from the offshore study I started in 2007, and that went up almost until the Panama Papers. So uh, the title of this is Turning Vice into Virtue. It's actually the name of an article I published in Human Relations about three years ago. And it's it was inspired in part by my previous attendance at the Reputation Symposium, where I talked about um, my work from Pop Finance on, on what they call um, retail investors in the US stock market. Um, and there, my concern was with how people identified with the stocks that they bought and how they, they cared about corporate reputation because they felt it reflected on them. 
This is a global study, um, as I'll show you, and it's about the professionals who, who uh, help the ultra wealthy hide their assets from the law offshore. But it circles back around to many of the same themes. Um, but in this case, it's a more uh, protective approach to reputation, protecting from scandal and crisis. So I tried to develop a theory about how people respond to um, having their reputations in tatters. The research question was, how do firms and professions respond to catastrophic reputational damage? Um, those linked to socially irresponsible or unethical or illegal conduct. So we know a little bit about this. Um, Remington, the gun maker, just went out of business a couple of years ago. Um, they're, they're further um, hammering their reputation into the ground, what's left of it, by subpoenaing the um, the school attendance and disciplinary records of five and six year olds who were murdered at, at Newtown. And of course, everyone knows the story of Arthur Anderson and what happened to the formerly elite professionals who worked for that organization. Um, they're chief frauditors now instead of auditors. It used to be such a, a plum to put Arthur Anderson on your CV just as it once was to put Enron on your CV, not anymore. So what do you do? What do you do about that? Especially if you're an elite professional. So for those who aren't familiar with wealth management, haven't been following the, the scandals of the Panama Papers of 2016 and the Paradise Papers of 2018, um, there's this profession that consists largely of lawyers and accountants and bankers, but there are some rogue academics and even a few people who come from as far afield as, as Greenpeace who find themselves specializing in, in service to the ultra wealthy. Um, and there we're talking like people like Musk would have a wealth manager, um, but also people with say $50 million in investable assets. So people much less wealthy than Musk. It's a pretty broad range, but definitely in the in the 0.01% of, of wealth, uh, at least among American households. So what you probably know about them is that they help the ultra wealthy avoid tax. And that's true, they do, but they also help the ultra wealthy avoid lots of other laws, um, inheritance laws and paying back their debts kind of laws too. The work they do is virtually all legal, but it's shady. It's, it exists and thrives in a gray area between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Ultimately, they cost the world about $200 billion a year in just in unpaid personal income taxes. That's Gabriel Zuckman's estimate. This thrived, the profession and the, their activities thrived in secrecy. So the Panama Papers leak of 2016, which was the world's largest data leak, I think it was 4.1 terabytes. Um, it was about 40 years worth of data from a single Panama-based wealth management firm called Mossack Fonseca. That really blew the, blew the cover off these people. And all of a sudden, they went from being like wealthy, elites, people didn't really know what they did, to bad people doing bad things, scumbags. And it really bothered them. It was, a, it was a personal crisis as well as a professional crisis for many practitioners. So here are some more examples of how the Panama Papers and later the Paradise Papers turned them into global bad guys. Um, one of the things that apparently really ticks off wealth managers these days is that the latest Bond movie involved um, a wealth manager, a Swiss wealth manager was the bad guy. So an actual Swiss wealth manager was quoted in a magazine article that went viral a couple of years ago saying like, that's the thing that really tipped him over the edge. Like he couldn't hold his head high in public because he couldn't tell people what he did anymore because his profession was now associated with Bond villain. So the puzzle is, the research puzzle is, 
it's sort of like that famous Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark. You'd expect all of these wealth managers, these well-to-do powerful elite attorneys and, and bankers and accountants to mount a vigorous public defense of their reputation after these, these attacks. But there's been mostly silence. Firms, professional societies, industry representatives, crickets all the way down. So where's the response to this massive reputational damage? For those of you who follow these things, you may remember that um, the, the firm whose data was leaked in the Panama Papers, Mossack Fonseca, they had one response to this global scandal, a 1,148 word press release that basically said, we did nothing illegal. If you don't like what we do, change the laws. End of story. And that was it. At best, if any individual professionals are held accountable for these sorts of things, they end up with what you might call the Sergeant Schultz defense. This was a, a term that was coined um, in relation to Bernie Ebers back 20 years ago during the WorldCom scandal, where the executives just say, eh, we didn't know. And, and they sort of skate along. On, on the idea of organizational complexity means they couldn't possibly be held accountable for any fraud that might have been committed by the, their underlings. So the research question is, how do, how do these reputational losses get repaired? And what's out there in the research literature so far is a look at what industries do or firms or organizations like professional associations do in response to reputational crises. What we don't know anything about is what the individuals do, but that's really important for a couple of reasons. I mean, theoretically, we need to know where the agency is. Like, is there no agency at the individual level? Second of all, many professions like wealth management are increasingly um, based on a kind of free agency. You, you certainly don't have lifetime employment. You bounce around to different firms or you set up as a sole proprietor. So the response is going to come from you as an individual professional if there's any response at all. So how do we understand their silence on this? So I approach this by looking at the institutional literature. There's a, there's a whole set of theories about institutional work, um, especially about agency at the individual level and how institutions can change based on what individuals do. It doesn't assume that there's any particular audience. So this isn't like the frames literature or the accounts literature. So what I've tried to do that's new is take this sort of category work, agentic self categorization studies and take it down to the level of professions and to look specifically at triggers in these crises of, of irresponsibility as a source of institutional change that goes macro. And ultimately the contribution is four mechanisms by which individual actors can trigger institutional change at the macro level. So what I'm talking about today grew out of the much larger project that as I mentioned lasted almost a decade um, and involved my starting by spending two years training to be a wealth manager because they don't answer emails or calls from nosy sociologists. Um, their whole ethos is silence and secrecy. So the only way to study them was basically like pony up 50 grand and spend two years going to their little seminars and getting a credential. It was sort of like a, a very specialized mini version of law and law school and business school rolled into one. And that was my ticket to elbow my way into their professional society meetings because you couldn't go unless you were either a student or held the credential. And that literally just put me face to face with practitioners. I didn't lie about who I was. I had a name tag with my real name and institutional affiliation. But I explained to, to practitioners, I'm trying to understand what you do. And they responded to me in 
the way that some people respond to a, a confessional. Um, when I promised them anonymity, the biggest problem I had was to get them to shut up once they started talking, because they essentially had no one else to talk to about their various um, war stories at work. I ended up with 65 interviews with wealth managers in 18 countries. And part of what I was trying to get at is, what is it that you think you're doing? What's, what are you proud of about your job? What are you not proud of about your job? What do you think is important? What do you wish people understood about your job? How do you respond to people thinking you've done something wrong? And that, that was really the hot button that, that wound them up, got them off to the races. So this is where I went um, because you can't really study the offshore system without going global. The whole thing works like an interconnected global network. And many of the places are quite hard to reach like the Cook Islands, it's really difficult to get there. That's important because it makes it harder to hold anyone who works there accountable. Um, I can get into that later for anyone who's interested, but here's the model I came up with out of, out of those 65 interviews. So you have at the field level, like the society or mass media globally, or civil society groups saying, hey, things like, tax avoidance by the wealthy or by corporations. That's not okay. That creates a legitimacy threat. And then that hits at the level of the individual practitioners. That kicks them into action. And they're saying to themselves, what do I have to do to maintain my image of myself as a good person and as a, a respectable professional? Those of you familiar with social psychology probably remember a guy named Albert Bandura, who 50 years ago was writing that Everybody wants to think of themselves as a good person. Even bad guys want to think of themselves as good people. And they will jump through the most ludicrous hoops to maintain that perception of themselves. So that's what this is about. It's people who know they're doing wrong, trying to make it okay with themselves. First, they have to make it okay with themselves. Then they go out in the world and make it okay with other people or try. So even before the Panama Papers hit, there was growing condemnation of wealth managers. The parliament of the UK characterized wealth management as completely and utterly and totally immoral, not sugarcoating it at all. The US Congress, a Senate investigation back when Carl Levin was still alive, um, he just passed away, uh, simply described the, the people I studied as just really bad people. So what does this mean for people who've like invested a lot of time in human capital and, and going to law school and getting these fancy jobs where they, they hobnob with billionaires? It pisses them off when they lose public respect. They didn't spend all those years becoming expert, trustworthy attorneys and accountants and bankers to the rich just to be treated like pariahs at cocktail parties. Remember like Alan Dershowitz being outraged that he wasn't invited to parties at Martha's Vineyard anymore? That's what I'm talking about. So, so some of the interviews that I conducted ended up with, with comments like, you know, people outside the industry think of what we do as evil and Machiavellian. Friends and family start to look at these people with some side eye and they don't like it. One person said, I'm very good at my job and I should be able to hold my head high. So I resent the tax shaming and tisk tisking at offshore these days. And the family, the family part hits hard. In everything I do, I want my son to be proud of his dad. So it's very distressing to hear how the work I do gets maligned. This guy worked for Mossack Fonseca in Panama City before the Panama Papers. So what are the strategies these people have for turning themselves into good people again, for turning vice back into virtue? Well, one of their, one of their classic maneuvers is to call on the, the classic narratives of what a professional is. What's a professional? Go back a couple hundred years. A professional is someone who serves the public with their expertise. So one of the things these folks do is they say, hey, Everybody's got us wrong. 
by helping our clients avoid tax, we're the good guys. We're protecting them from rapacious governments. We all believe in taxes in civilized societies. They provide essential services, but it's theft by another word. When taxes get ridiculous, as they do at times, the tax avoidance industry arises. Another strategy for doing this is, is deflection to say, oh, look over there, look at that good thing we did. So this is classic, especially in the, in the offshore centers and, and among the wealth managers who serve um, Chinese and Indian billionaires, they say. Out of every dollar that's gone into India, 43 cents has passed through Mauritius for tax savings. Without us, maybe India wouldn't have gotten the investment it has gotten in the last 10 years. So these folks present themselves as the heroes of foreign direct investment in developing countries. Another classic professional narrative these folks call upon is the idea of the disinterested professional, meaning neutral, impartial, set apart from the world of, of vulgar interests and, and commercial concerns. So one of the things they do is just talk about how great it is that they can suspend their own personal sense of ethics. A lot of things are legal in different parts of the world, but I think you just have a code of ethics as a professional and you give professional advice, setting aside whatever you think about that. Or <clears throat> they simply redefine the morality of what they do to exclude any of the problematic parts. Like they talk about what a wonderful intellectual puzzle their work is. And that's true, it is. Every day is different when you're doing tax mitigation. The laws change, the client's assets change. It's a great puzzle to solve, like an immense Rubik's cube. True, as far as it goes, it just excludes the consequences. So, so what? This is a partial answer to the question of how misconduct keeps happening. How do people live with themselves day to day? How do they wake up, look themselves in the mirror and say, I'm still a good person? The German philosopher Jürgen Habermas calls this moral self-authorization. As I mentioned, it's the first step to legitimating your work, your profession, your reputation to others. The first step is you have to authorize yourself morally. You have to believe that you're a good person. It also reasserts the importance of normative claims and professions. If you follow the professions literature, one of the big trends of the last couple of decades has been the commercialization of law, of accounting, um, of medicine, much to the detriment of professional honor and norms. This theory kind of recenters the role of norms, although they're being kind of perverted in their application here. Also from, for the institutional literature, what I'm trying to contribute is a, uh, a theory of change, a reputation threat as a trigger for institutional change and for, for particular types of responses to that. Finally, it's useful for practice. If you're a policymaker and you want some leverage on misconduct, what you gotta go for is these self-authorization processes. You wanna target that. Um, it's very surprising. One of the biggest surprises of, of the, the decade or so I spent offshore is that while legal penalties and financial penalties don't matter very much for some of these elite professionals and their clients, they care a lot about shame and social status and reputation, like a lot. It may be the one thing that will bring them up short. Um, you can harness that for policy purposes. Um, some of the stuff that, that Professor Kirsch just talked about with using social media to name and shame. That works. It can, it can work. Um, there's an interesting study of this conducted in Israel by my colleague Adam Hofrey, who's a law professor, in which this was used to basically rein in um, out of control wealth management professionals in Israel and, and get them to play ball with the government in order to reduce the country's tax losses. And it worked just leveraging shame and professional reputational concerns. If you're interested in more, here's the article in Human Relations. Thanks for giving me the time to talk about this and I'll look forward to your questions. Well, there are a number of questions that are um, 
emerging on the Q and A. And again, I'm just going to let them um, sit there for a moment, and Brooke can read them, and I think we'll address them um, after the next speaker. Um, to to finish this off, it would be great to have Frank's opinion of all this and his perception of it, given all his experience. So, Frank, take over at this point. Many thanks to Brooke. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris, for organizing this and being a thought leader in Rupert. Hi, thanks again, and hopefully we'll see all of you in person. I can see the list of who's here, so it's great to be among you. And, um, and David and Brooke, those were fascinating, and I'll try to weave some of this together. Um, we'll talk law. You want to talk some law? Yeah, we're going to talk law. That's the idea here, and Brooke really teed it up nicely uh, just now, talking about legal pen penalties not mattering much. And so what I like to try to do is talk about the legal perspective on fraud and reputation. Um, it's not the only perspective on fraud, and, and we just heard mostly a legal or non-legal perspectives on fraud. So I want to add legal perspectives into the mix. So I'll do that for a little while, talk about recent research and theory and practice on law. So I, like, I feel like I'm with you. Are you with me here? You with me? We've been learning these techniques now that we're online. So you can at least see my, see my face up front. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about a little bit is um, just some of the threads that I've been drawing through as I've been thinking about the great financial fraudsters of time and um, what they share. And there's one in particular that I've been thinking about a lot, the greatest female fraudster of all time. And I know you might be thinking that it's Elizabeth Holmes, um, but I'll hold you in suspense for a little while because it's not her even though her trial is going on right now. I've been thinking a little bit about gender and financial fraud. So I'd like to ask you as if we were all together for some help on that second piece. Okay, so that's my plan. Um, and let's start off just by talking about the big picture. I think you know uh, much of what we just heard about is situated within this kind of legal theory of, of fraud. And this, um, this notion uh, that the legal theory of fraud is very different from what we might think of as, as psychological theories of fraud and how we view ourselves as being good people or right and wrong, as Brooke just discussed, and also the finance theory of fraud, sort of cynical view of fraud, um, where people think about building up a reputation as a capital asset, and fraud is just some expenditure of that capital asset that's perfectly rational from a rational financial actor. And, and the legal theory of fraud um, really confronts that and confronts the ec economist view, really started by Adam Smith um, and, and brought forward by a number of law and economic scholars that, um, that law is really just there as a backstop and that reputation is really the way to deal with fraud. And so Smith in his lectures on justice, police, revenue and arms, that's not in his top five, uh, but it's a it's a good one, and he distinguishes between repeated interactions, people engaging in lots of repeated interactions with neighbors, and if you're doing that, reputation is a constraint uh, for fraud. But if you're dealing with strangers, you're actually going to be disposed or predisposed to cheat because of the lack of reputational consequence. And I think what Brooke just said about uh, legal penalties not mattering much. Um, is very instructive there. And so one view of the law is the law only matters when reputation is not a viable constraint. And of course, it's very hard to figure out when that is. But this is kind of the law and economics theory. And it pertains to the financial markets where issuers of securities have incentives to disclose quality information and invest in reputation if they're more like they're in that kind of neighborly environment and they'll suffer reputational loss. Um, and so the theory is really about repeat play and um, it's an information story. And one of the things that the legal theorists do is take one step further and add gatekeepers, add third parties who for a Theranos or, or an Enron or potentially a Tesla, although I'll say parenthetically that Tesla, although there are people who think of it as a fraud, um, has not been proven to be a fraud and that the claims in the securities class action, and we'll see what happens in the Delaware case um, so far have not been all that successful. The suit against the board settled for a decent chunk of money, but the securities claims against Tesla so far have been dismissed. But the idea is that gatekeepers like an underwriter or an accounting firm, the professionals that uh, Chris talks about and that uh, Brooke was just talking about um, will step in and that they have incentives 
even if the issuers of security do securities do not. And so the idea is that these gatekeepers would screen um, against fraudulent transactions. And so we would rely on them to pledge their reputations. And so even if the company is in its final period uh, and has an incentive to commit fraud, the theory is that underwriters, for example, will serve the gatekeeping function. Okay, so that's kind of the law theory. It, it has a, a dark side and there's several reasons why people don't think the assumptions might hold. And these are reasons why, as, as Brooke said, the legal penalties might not matter very much or might not work um, because misconduct is expensive to detect and prosecute and the probability of detection is low. Um, so it could be it can be rational for people to engage in this, this kind of conduct and assets at the end of the period can be uh, inadequate. So, so, so the reputation and law could fail at the same time. Um, there are agency costs within these entities. And so even the gatekeepers uh, are rife with agency costs. And so they might not play much of a role. Um, we might not think there is repeat play so that we're always sort of in an end period, um, both for people who are participating as intermediaries and for the, the Elon Musks themselves. And it can be hard to figure out whether or not there is a fraud after the fact. One of the themes that I'll talk about in just a second is that some of the greatest fraudsters actually end up, as we look at the carcasses, um, having done a fairly legitimate job in many ways. And so the parsing of what was legitimate and what was illegitimate, it, it can be very difficult. Um, and, and I mentioned that it, it's largely an information story uh, in terms of the theory of, um, of the legal approach to fraud. Um, information markets might not, might not work very well and uh, information costs might be high. So these are, um, these are kind of the theory pieces of the puzzle. And the other thing I think might be useful for this group is just to keep in mind the elements of legal claims. So um, they are gray areas. Uh, Brooke and I both contributed chapters to the gray areas um, a symposium that Gregory Jackson put together, you might remember from several years ago. And I think that's a nice theme, but it's also, I think, helpful. And I'll just quickly run through just so we all remember that you have, you have to prove a legal claim, and that means you have to prove elements. And I didn't talk about this in my chapter, um, the six shades of gray. That was what I called mine, just to try to be provocative. Um, but I'll call this six shades of securities fraud, I guess. Um, something about six seems to work in the securities area. But, but the idea is that you have to establish falsity, materiality, intent, reliance, causation, and damages. And each of those six throws up a, a barrier. And this is one of the reasons why I think, as Brooks said, legal penalties often don't matter much, is that you can, you can tell yourself a story about how you're a good person. You can engage in a psychology, but you can also establish yourself as acting legally by avoiding one of these six. So falsity, you have a claim that this, what I'm saying wasn't actually false. Um, materiality, you can have a claim that a reasonable investor wouldn't consider this all that important. So the big Supreme Court case recently involving Goldman Sachs involved misstatements about them uh, putting clients' interests first and identifying and avoiding conflicts. And some people would say, well, that's not, not material because everyone knows that Goldman has conflicts and the reasonable investor wouldn't think that they would put their clients' interests first. Um, there, there's knowledge, and this is hard to prove. This will be true in the Holmes case. It's true for Musk. It's true in every criminal uh, prosecution for fraud, certainly. Um, proving a state of mind is very difficult. Um, reliance by the third party. Sometimes uh, investors uh, are required to have what's called eyeball reliance, meaning that they actually read and relied on a statement, but that's not the typical uh, kind of requirement. It's more looking to the market as to whether there was a fraud on, on the market, but that can be very challenging. Um, causation, whether there's a link between a misstatement and a fraud, there's a lot of games that people play about leaking information and bundling information. Um, one of the SEC commissioners just had this past few days a statement about concerns about putting out you know, three or four pieces of information at the same time, and the market doesn't react negatively. You know, hey, we had a bad quarter, there were all these problems that were 
real problems. There was the pandemic. And oh, by the way, we also committed this massive fraud. Well, the market didn't react. So there, there can be causation problems and then damages uh, can be difficult to prove as well. So, so there you go. You learned some law. Um, so the last thing I'll say just in a couple of minutes is talking about kind of the key themes that go into these major frauds. And there's one that I've been looking at in particular. I don't have any slides, but I'll tell you a little bit about her story. Um, and, and it's very interesting to me, I think, that the, these themes of the major fraudsters, like, like Arbor Kruger, as Chris uh, mentioned, the Match King and Bernie Madoff and, um, and so, many, uh, so many others, uh, run together, that these are compelling personalities who are trustworthy to us. Um, they also don't overstate their returns. And Musk is quite different in this way because the great fraudsters, historically at least, have mostly promised and delivered low double digit returns, not the kinds of tripling uh, in a relatively short period of time that a Tesla has delivered. Um, and then, the, so the first element is personality. The second element is these low double digit returns. And then the third element is that they, is, I'm talking about law, right? So they're at least partly legitimate. They start off with legal businesses and it can be hard to establish that, uh, that these are really frauds. And so this was true of Madoff, um, starting off as a legitimate market maker. It certainly was true of Kruger. And so here's just a quick version of fast forwarding to my person. So her name is Gina Champion Kane. Um, she lived in my neighborhood and no one suspected until the very end that she had perpetrated a three to $400 million pyramid scheme. She, was a she had all three elements, a trustworthy persona, low double digit returns, and a legitimate story based on essentially the securitization of liquor licenses in California. So the idea was um, she discovered this when she got her first restaurant that you need to put money in an escrow account to get a liquor license. And there are lots and lots of people who are doing that. And so she went out and said, well, how about um, you sophisticated investors? Why don't you give me some money and I'll lend it to these people who are invest, who need to invest in liquor licenses to set up their restaurant. And she was able to parlay that into a, a massive scheme, the largest financial uh, fraud scheme ever perpetrated by a woman. And we might say, oh, well, why are you talking about gender and financial fraud? But all of the great financial fraudsters of history have been male. So, so if I just list them off, Law, Ponzi, Kruger, Whitney, Keating, Leeson, Stanford, Minko, Belfort, Madoff, I don't need to say Ivar, Richie, Bernie or Nick or uh, you know, Richard, uh, you, you know, they're all men, right? And so, so there's this uh, very interesting story in San Diego and it's Gina, okay, a new kind of approach. But I've been having a really hard time trying to, trying to get traction on this and figure out how to, how to tell this story in a compelling way. And I think, um, you know, my big takeaway from, uh, from these panels so far is Brooke's uh, phrase, crickets all the way down. I, I've never, I'm going to use that. Crickets all the way, not turtles, crickets all the way down. And I think there's something about our current markets and the short sellers just being destroyed. You know, D David talking about these, all these short sellers. I mean, they've gotten their heads handed to them and many people are exiting the sh uh, short selling business um, and saying they'll never do it again. Uh, lawyer, plaintiff's lawyers are having a hard time in these cases. Journalists are having a hard time monetizing. And then the people who are the storytellers, even to us, uh, what's the what's the payoff to you know to, to writing about and figuring out this scheme? So during the pandemic, I interviewed basically everyone who was involved at the periphery of this uh, scheme involving my neighbor, and she's in jail now. Um, she talked to me a little bit, but she had. I'm trying to get her to talk to me from jail, and we'll see if she'll if she'll engage in the kind of exercise that Brooke uh, discussed, you know, about the kind of subjective, oh, I'm a good person, but that runs into the teeth of, oh, I'm in jail. Um, and so it'd be interesting to hear her, but I'd love to hear your, um, all of your thoughts about where I might take this project now. That was fantastic, Frank. And I really want to hear more about her, but I think I should open it up to some of the questions that are out there. So um, it may be that people have had a chance to look at some of these uh, questions. 
and that they that we can um, answer some of them, but also um, take some more along the way. By the way, I'll add one little thing that I've been working on, which is sort of interesting into, into Brooks work. Um, I've been looking at 19th century people who were caught um, via promises that, that well, they, they were buying fidelity guarantees for their firms. And these were uh, small people who were caught having um, stolen money. And the interesting thing that took me a while to find, um, and Brooke will know the, the sociological background on this that Durkheim engaged in on suicide, was that people in the 19th century who were found to have uh, committed fraud were 50 times more likely to commit suicide than the general statistics. And that is statistically valid and also I find remarkable. It really, these were not necessarily, you know, big important people who'd committed a financial crime. They were small actors, but they, but they valued their reputation. They knew what would come and um, they killed themselves. So as you say, it's, it's very individual, not just um, broad. Anyway, back to uh, some questions. David, you were up first and there were some issues that were raised by people. Do you want to speak to any of these things? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, although uh, if, if, if there are other, well, uh, yeah, let me, let me just uh, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll run through a couple of them. The, the network question is, it's a good one and it's actually, but it's really hard to get data from Twitter of the full network, right? So even the researcher access, we get certain pieces of, uh, of it, but it's, but to actually reconstruct the entire network is a little, is a little hard. So um, we're, we're working on that. On the question of the sort of cause and effect with Musk's behavior, um, we have all of um, Elon's tweets and it's very clear that they're, you know, he gets a huge reaction. Uh, he's got these 50 million uh, followers um, and he's a very good tweeter. Like this is, you know, he is, this is something he, this is his like superpower in some way is to kind of, you can't, you, we can't, you know, do content analysis on it because there's all this, you know, double entendre and, and, uh, you know, jokes about pot and sex and, and kind of teenage male fantasies. And, you know, so it's, um, that, that, that then mixed in with like really sweet things like, oh, I, you know, I'm so proud of my Tesla workers, um, the ones I haven't like fired and sued. Um, you know, so th there's this kind of, um, so, so I think it's, it's really, we're working to try and gather this data in a systematic way. But in the end, I think what we've, where we've learned the most is just reading. <laughs> And I think, you know, reading tweets is kind of a way to lose your mind in some sense. Um, so uh, I think there, you know, and also what, would it be that surprising that like Musk tweets and something and the stock moves? Like, I think we sort of would expect that to happen. So then I think we, what we're trying to figure out is like, where are the other kind of pieces of that network? Who are the other influencers? Is it some sort of power law where there's a hundred, you know, he's got 50 million and there's someone else with 10 million and then 2 million and all the way down to, to you know, to, to uh, just the, the regular uh, mom and pop investors. So it, it's interesting, but I think I'm trying to like, I'm not sure what we would learn by this sort of cause and effect. We, we know there's that must does something and people react. On uh, Ron, to Rhonda, uh, Rhonda Rieger asks, um, you know, uh, she says, I still love my uh, 2016 Model S and have made a tidy gain on Tesla stock purchased at the same time. So I guess I'm a fanboy, a fangirl. Um, having said that, I especially like the evidence of corporate supporting bots. Do you have a perspective on corporations using bots to support their reputation and are activists or competitors using bots against firms? I think this is a really fascinating question and area where I think we could be, we'll need to be doing some more research because, uh, you know, we don't know. All we know is that there were eight bots started within an hour of each other, um, you know, on the day that Tesla stock was plummeting. And I don't think anyone's going to own up and say, oh yeah, that was, you know, Elon told me to do that, right? This is, you know, to, to Frank's point, you know, the, the, the intent or, you know, kind of the, the smoking gun. I just don't think we're going to find it. But thinking about, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking of someone like, uh, you know, Phil Howard, 
uh, Phil Howard's work at, at, at Oxford on you know computational propaganda, right? That's basically what this is. It's computational propaganda and sort of figuring out th does that mean that firms need to disclose when they're engaging in computational propaganda? Is that part of their you know PR budget? Um, you know, I think I think the Tesla people would say, oh, it doesn't matter. It does, you know, whatever we were doing, that was just Twitter. All that mattered is we made a great car. Um, but but I think, you know, my suggestion is that it does matter um, and that this these did have consequences. So anyway, I think there were a couple other questions. Um, Brooke, I, I think there was uh, about the interviews. Do you want to pick up uh, some of that? And, and I realize you may need to read the question because I, I, I was sort of assuming everyone saw the question. I don't know if people can actually see the Q&A or not. Oh, it may be the case that Brooke, because of some stuff at the beginning, can't see the question. Um, can you, can actually, can you read that, David? Yeah, so there's a question from uh, Rohan who asked, if everyone knows how companies avoid paying taxes, why doesn't the government do anything to make sure these companies do pay their taxes as it will clearly increase their tax revenues for administration? You're on mute, Stan. Um, first of all, I should say my specialty is in uh, individual high net worth individuals, not corporate tax avoidance, but the general pattern that we saw when say the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers came out is that all of the people in government who are empowered to put a stop to this are also implicated in this. They have massive conflicts of interest. So the, the classic example is former UK Prime Minister David Cameron, who was um, made a rep, bit of a reputation for himself scolding um, boy bands, for example, for basing themselves for tax purposes in Ireland to, to reduce their tax bill. And in the Panama Papers, we came to find out that Cameron himself was the beneficiary of an offshore trust. Um, <clears throat> and there's story after story after story after story of heads of state um, being pers personally implicated in offshore shenanigans. So they have um, less reason than most of us to shut this system of tax avoidance. That's the legal way of avoiding tax. Um, to, to shut it down because they benefit from it. Um, and that goes for both corporate and, and personal tax avoidance. As for companies, well, what, one of the people I interviewed, one of the wealth managers I interviewed in, in London, very elegant man with braces and a signet ring on his pinky said, <clears throat> what do you think is more powerful, Procter & Gamble or the government of France? He said, well, of course it's Procter & Gamble, multinational companies dictate terms to states. And he didn't just mean like states in the US sense, like Alabama, although they do that too. Like states like countries where, you know, Procter & Gamble comes in and says, okay, we'll create a bunch of jobs for you. We'll make you look good, but you need to give us a 20 year tax break and a bunch of other perks or we're out of here. Um, and that happens over and over again. So there's again, no incentive to crack down on any tax avoidance by corporations because they have the whip hand over policymakers and lawmakers. You know, Procter and Gamble giveth, but Procter and Gamble taketh away. Let me add two more that came. You know, there are a bunch of questions out there, so let me add two more to you, um, Brooke. Um, one is from Victor Chen. I wonder if moral licensing plays a role until negative press. Um, becomes uh, an, uh, an identity threat. And then the second one is from Mobson Chowdhury, which says, um, do you see professionals from their reputational, reputation ruined um, firms, for example, Enron and Arthur Anderson, use the same categories as wealth managers do to reposition, distance themselves from the shame? Is the shame more strongly associated with career histories than careers themselves? That's a really good question. It's a, it's a good empirical question. Someone should do that study. Um, one of the things I've always wondered is whatever happened to the people who did work for Enron? Like, what do they do with their CVs? Maybe someone has published work on that, but like, 
do they just have a big gap in their CDs now? Or if they don't have, you know, because their choice is keep the stigmatized company on the CV and account for their time or have a huge gap in your, in your CD. Like neither of those are great options. What do you do? Has anyone studied that? Um, I, I will just say, you know, having studied all these failed startups, um, that uh, um, there's a, a wide variety of practices in sort of LinkedIn where people will say they were part of a company that failed, um, but, you know, because they feel they can tell a story, you know, sort of fail forward fast. I was a Silicon Valley, it was, we were risk takers, I was an entrepreneur. Um, and so there's a way to cleanse it, um, I think, in, in, uh, in, in the kind of entrepreneurial context that it is less um, stigmatizing than in that professional context that you're talking about. Hmm. Can I uh, direct one to Frank? It doesn't necessarily say this, but Frank, have you seen the question from Rohan about uh, what about the companies which are legally illegal? Um, uh, the rest of the question goes, are they to blame or the, or the lawmakers? How can laws be made effective if companies find a way to take advantage of the loopholes in these laws? I think this is a great question. And uh, it relates to the answer Brooke just gave as well, which I think is right about tax. And that's that these, these cases, we talk about the legal illegal distinction, but the, the case that's brought after the fact against someone, a person or a company to, to prove that what they did was, was on the illegal side of this um, line is really hard. Um, and how do you tell? I mean, just the, the assumption in what's what is Ill legally illegal. Uh, it was hard even to establish that a lot of Enron's transactions after the fact were uh, were illegal. And so, given that there's this this kind of uh, gray border area, um, it's really hard to make laws more effective to stop that. Um, and that's doubly difficult because once everyone knows what the laws are and what the cases are, what the statute, you have language, okay? So Rohan, imagine that you drafted language that would say, here's, here's what we're, uh, where the line is, then uh, very sophisticated actors will, will take advantage of that, right? Well, and will engineer their transactions. And so regulatory arbitrage is a big piece of this as well. And I think that plays into um, not only the difficulty of prosecution, but also the this sort of psychological idea that this is um, that this is potentially not all that problematic. And I'll just say it relates to Rupert. Rupert had asked a question. I'll just I'm I'm also listed as a moderator. I think all the things I said before were immoderate. So maybe I'll be <laughs> moderate now. I don't know, but I think it does have to do with um, the governmental approach as well. And Rupert asks a, a really nice question about the. SEC in the US and a no admission of guilt uh, settlements for financial misconduct. And so I think this also plays into the idea of this line that Rohan is asking about, where um, if we say after the fact, okay, we've investigated you and there isn't much of a consequence, then I think um, that there isn't the kind of salience that might lead to people keeping in mind, oh, I better not do this because this person was punished for it. You know, on that point, I'll just say, you know, uh, there's this, there was this uh, um, instance with Musk a couple of years ago where he sent out this tweet, you know, 420 funding secured, which was adjudicated uh, as to be a, a fraudulent statement, uh, and he paid a fine. Uh, he and Tesla pay, each paid, I believe, a $25 million fine. Now, I, I just told you his wealth increased by a hundred billion. So it's, uh, you know, it wasn't even a parking ticket. Can I jump in here with, a, with an answer? I'm gonna, since I'm not a panelist, I shouldn't do this, but, or a, a response to Holger's question about um, the somewhat different pattern is the reaction of Volkswagen when their diesel fraud had become public. Not only uh, tried politics to support them, but they managed to turn the public outcry into a marketing scheme for innovation and leave the blame to the individuals. 
I agree. And what's interesting is that in, in, in Volkswagen's longer history, and this is something that various of us know about, it, it, this was, of course, um, Hitler's dream car. And so the idea that it could be remarketed after the war brought from a car that had ruins to being sold to the hippies in California as the love bug is an extraordinary reaction that they had, which they did with various kinds of marketing over the years, just switching the story completely about what the car was about and uh, doing outrageous kind of claims to restructure the company and misdirecting. So uh, Volkswagen has been actually quite of exceptional in being able to hit, to hit scandal, to have reputational damage and flip the narrative as it is doing right now to being a totally electric car company that will, um, you know, that will no longer have diesel or petrol engines and how sorry they are. They advertise actually the scandal itself to say that this is the best thing that could have happened to the company and to the world more generally. So you're absolutely right. There's another way to, to handle this through advertising. It's pretty extraordinary. I don't know if anybody else has wants to speak to that. Brooke, please. So when I talk to the OECD or the European Parliament or individual tax authorities in different countries, they always want to know, okay, what do we do about this? How do we stop these people? And I'm, is it okay if I share my screen and show you something? I want to show you the results of um, a, uh, an HMRC here, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Study. They actually did a small qualitative study at the UK tax authority of high net worth individuals um, who were, they considered high risk as tax evaders or tax avoiders, I should say, and their wealth managers. And they basically said, well, what if, let's say hypothetically, we found out that you were avoiding your tax obligations in kind of a sketchy manner in a legal gray area. Let's talk about some things we could do. Here's a menu of three options. Please tell us how you would react to them. So my, my point to policymakers is you're not gonna skin this cat by passing more laws alone. Laws are fine, but it's not gonna solve the problem alone. And one of the things that will solve this is skillful use of social forces, including shame, because high net worth individuals and their clients believe that it's a parking ticket for the most part, they'll just buy their way out of it. So turns out from HMRC's research that these folks are unusually sensitive to social norms and, and reputational threat, which are surprisingly easy and cheap to deploy. So here's some, some quotes from this HMRC study that came out in January, 2019. The least concerning sanctions in our study were financial penalties, especially for the very wealthy as they felt they could absorb the cost. So this has been our speculation in this panel, but here it is from the horse's mouth. Yeah, we don't care. Fine us till the cows come home, we don't care. But there is a fear of reputational damage for both agents and individuals. That means both wealth managers and their clients. The moral tone of the media coverage and of public and political discourse has succeeded in shifting norms and has highlighted the expensive and time consuming consequences of being investigated. In other words, the costs of reputational risk just got driven up. And social media is a really big part of that because it's one thing, what HMRC was proposing in their menu of options were financial sanctions or we'll take you to court and both of those were just like, meh, we don't care. Option three was we'll publish your name in the newspaper. And then it was like, oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, that's legacy media. That's not putting you on blast on Twitter, which is, you know, that's like, that's the nuclear option. That's what these people care about. And, and I think there's a way to leverage this. Speaking of advertising, one of the things that I, I didn't know about until recently, do, do you guys know about the Donald Duck cartoons that were shown in between feature films in the 40s to get people to pay their taxes? No. no. <laughs> Tell Donald, me more. Donald freaking Duck was in on this. So check this out. This would have been, this was a Disney short from I think 1943. Um, it, it, this would have been part of the same thing that made people, um, oh, wait a second, I'm gonna share my sound too. Um, this would have been part of the same effort 
like uh, getting people to buy war bonds that most people are familiar with but disney produced a series of cartoons featuring old donald here um on the premise that paying your taxes, and there's something in paying your taxes is a patriotic act so i'll just show you a very brief clip of this important you can do you won't get a medal for doing it oh that's all right it may mean a sacrifice on your part but it will be a vital help to your country in this hour of need. Shall I tell you what it is? Yes, what is it? Tell me. Shall I? Tell me what it is. Your income tax. Income tax? Yes, your income tax. income tax. It may not seem important to you, but it is important. What? Yes, and it's your privilege, not just your duty, but your privilege to help your government by paying your tax and paying it promptly. Oh, what's the big hurry? What's the big hurry? Your country is at war. Your country needs taxes for guns, taxes for ships. The sooner you get your taxes in, the sooner they'll get to work. For it's your taxes, my taxes, our taxes that run the factories. You get the idea. So imagine that rebooted on social media. My contention is if you can get teenagers around the world to swallow Tide Pods and dump buckets of ice water over their heads, you can get them to think paying tax is cool. It shouldn't be that hard. That's great. You know, this, I, I was just going to say, I, R Rupert asked this question about if the SEC should forbid no admission of guilt settlements. Um, and I think, you know, maybe one way to think, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious, I, I hadn't thought of that, but, you know, in a way, you're, the, the data you've just shared, uh, Rook, suggests that that, you know, could be a very powerful um, uh, you know, mechanism. If, if people had to admit guilt, you couldn't just, you know, the Purdue Pharma, the Sacklers couldn't just, you know, pay $4 billion and, and walk away. Put those people in the stocks in the public square. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, they clean up their act real quick, I promise you. And, and that, honestly, just all the data sort of converge on this point. <clears throat> People you'd think were laughing all the way to the bank and couldn't give a fig what anyone else thought of them care profoundly about what other people think of them. They care about their legacy. I'll just say it's very difficult to put people in the in the stocks, um, <laughs> at least in the U.S. Uh, it, it is it is interesting to think about what a coercive campaign like that would do today. I think my students would never pay taxes after seeing some sort of attempt like that, right? They would they would <laughs> do every tax avoidance scheme and once they made money that they could possibly think of. I think all of us as researchers also have an interesting new market to look at. I've been spending some time looking at uh, NFTs and crypto where the reputational consequences are so different and where yeah. many of the kinds of um, tools that we, we think about just don't work at all. And, um, you know, that'll be a fascinating area for us all to think about sort of the polar opposites of the, you know, the, the NFT world where there's anonymity and, you know, you can rip someone off and the, once they get a sense that, that there's been a scam, they'll actually gravitate towards that area, right? Um, as opposed to the kind of more traditional uses of shaming and putting people in the stocks. And of yeah, course, that want, I, with David. <laughs> well, I, I have um, actually, if, as long as we're showing a few supplemental slides, I have um, some some slides about some altcoin pump and dumps that um, actually are kind of r right on this point. So I, I, if I'll take, I don't know if, if, if I take one more second to do this, uh, I don't know if people can see, but these were some, uh, so the, this was this spring, um, these were, uh, what are called these alt coins where, uh, um, a bunch of influencers kind of, uh, 
YouTubers, these are basically, uh, I think, Twitch gamer uh, groups, were kind of doing these classic pump and dumps on uh, on cryptocurrency. So this was Save the Kids. You see they, um, you know, uh, 10, 20 million uh, followers get this, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm investing in this cool new uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, let's see if I can get, the, um, here was another one. This was the, the MILF coin, I'd, altcoin. I don't know what that, you know, and then here this person with 2.4 million followers was, you know, literally burning their reputation from my perspective. <laughs> you know, I'm giving away money if you, you know, you have to tweet that you, uh, some evidence that you have actually purchased this coin. And then you can see that there, it just uh, races right down. Um, here was another one, Be Social. Again, some of these same influencers with 5 million, 7 million, uh, sorry, 5 million, 6 million uh, followers are getting, getting in, into this. Um, and I, I will just say, um, Elon Musk did this too uh, with, with Dogecoin. Um, where, you know, he tweeted at one point, you know, Dogecoin may be my favorite cryptocurrency and you see um, volume spikes and, and so does uh, the price. It, it certainly enough for him to, um, to dump it. So I think we, we do have to, the, the, the norms in these contexts are different. Um, and people are, are um, to, Frank, to your point, you know, it's, there's a, uh, it's like honey, um, you know, pe people are somehow, it, it, this should destroy your reputation and somehow it doesn't. David, didn't he though disavow it on Sunday Night Live? So he did this weird thing where he pumped it and then said it's, it's a joke. And so gets to have it both ways, right? He makes the yeah. money, but isn't involved in anything fraudulent or worrisome because he said, no, no, don't believe me. You never believed me, did you? So he gets it both ways, right? He gets to be yeah. the honest truth teller. At the same time, he tells something that he knows is ridiculous and wins from it, right? So that's the yeah. marvelous if a quality. CEO, if a CEO were to pump their own stock in this way, it would be illegal. You cannot, you can't talk up, make false, uh, you know, material false statements about your own stock and, you know, owning it and have it go up and then like, oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you've already sold it, right? That you can't do. But if it's somebody else's stock or some other security or, a, you know, Dogecoin, some weird crypto thing, you know, he just does it every day. He wakes up and says, uh, I'm buying, I'm selling, I'm buying, I'm selling. So if you have the power to move markets, what, you know, and you're just kind of churning out tens of millions in profits each time. Okay, well, I'm conscious that we've had such a great time to go on for hours, but also that we've gone over the limit of our stated time. So I don't know if anybody wants to add any last thing before going, but more generally, I certainly want to add that I appreciate the panelists and the conversation we've had and everybody who came along to this because I know that we're all busy, but um, I, I hope that this has been a lot of fun for everybody. Um, I absolutely enjoyed it. And I know that we'll continue to have these conversations. I hope in Oxford at the Reputation uh, symposium, but I hope um, that this will continue at you know all sorts of events around the world. And particularly, I say Frank hosts some great stuff, but so does everybody else. So anyway, um, that's my last word on this. If anybody else, Frank, Frank is my co-host. So if he wants to add anything, he's talking to. <laughs> thank you. And Rupert, thank you. Thanks, Rupert. Rupert. Okay. I think nice that's to see it. everybody. Thanks and uh, see you soon in person.